we are nearly 7,000 kilometers from where the Nile River flows into the Mediterranean. And there, somewhere behind Rwanda's thousand hills, is what many explorers sacrificed their lives to find, the source of the Nile. This area, along the border with Congo, has long been characterized not only by war, but also by a shady trade in diamonds and rare minerals. Therefore, I was escorted by the local police chief and soldiers of the Rwandan army on my way through the jungle to find where the Nile rises. Finally, I reach the place. <laughs> I'm at the furthest source of the White Nile. The Nile has been controlled by pharaohs, Roman emperors and Turkish sultans, Napoleon, and the British Empire from Queen Victoria to Winston Churchill. Now it binds 11 countries even closer together in a common destiny they cannot escape. They must apportion the waters of the river they share. I have been studying the Nile my entire adult life. These are some of the books I've written about it. My life story, in fact, confirms the age-old saying, he who has drunk from the Nile will always return. I have sailed the world's great rivers and examined the role of water around the globe. But no river is more legendary and controversial than the Nile. Join me on a journey from the times of the pharaohs to the present, up the world's longest river, from its outlet in the Mediterranean to its sources in the heart of Africa. I have met people who are totally dependent on the water of the Nile. Our life is Nile. And I've talked to those who decide how the river should flow. Right now, the struggle for power over the Nile is more dramatic and complex than ever before in history. And the Nile has been master and servant for humans for 5,000 years. In the previous program, we traveled along the Nile where it flows through more desert than any other river in the world, and to where the blue and white Nile meet in Khartoum. We saw how Egypt and Sudan have become increasingly dependent on the Nile, and how they have fought for what they believe is their historical right to all the water in the river. In this program, we travel up the White Nile through the world's largest swamp and into the rainforests of Central Africa to see how the countries along this river are now rebelling against Egypt's traditional domination of the Nile. I will declare the independence of Southern Sudan. After almost 50 years of civil war, South Sudan, in 2011, separated from Sudan. South Sudan is a weak and poor state, but as we shall see, the world's least developed country holds the key to the entire region's future because of the way the Nile flows through its landscape. Anne Ito was one of the rebel movement's leaders for many years. I meet her when the excitement of independence is running high, 
and she asks me if I want to hear the new national anthem. There is so much that the Nile gives us that we can't think about a life without the Nile. I think if you talk to any ethnic group, even if they live very far away from the Nile, they will have a story about the Nile. We have spiritual relationship with the Nile. In South Sudan, the Nile is, however, much more than just a rich reservoir of myths and religious stories. When the Nile here meanders slowly across a vast, completely flat plain, it creates a very unusual water landscape. A landscape that has determined what types of societies could develop and the area's geopolitical position. When the river overflows its banks in the rainy season, it forms a wetland area larger than the Benelux countries combined. And here live millions of people. For long periods, transport on the river has been blocked by floating plant debris. 2,000 years ago, this stopped Roman soldiers in search of the Nile sources. Later, it became a watery grave for countless traders. And in the 1800s, it protected the population against slave raids from Egypt and northern Sudan. The Arabs called this part of the White Nile El Sud, or the Barrier. In the late 1800s, British colonialists entered the scene. They used dynamite to blast their way through the barriers, not looking for gold or cheap raw materials like regular imperialists might be expected to do, but looking for more water for the cotton fields in Egypt. The British knew that the White Nile lost over half of its water on its way through the swamps. Therefore, they came up with one of the most revolutionary ideas of their time. Here in southern Sudan, in the swamps, they would dig an artificial river nearly 400 kilometers long. In 1910, they sent down the first excavators to build the canal. But it turned out that this project was too ambitious, even for the British Empire. But this dream of increasing the flow of water to the Nile in Egypt did not die with the empire. In the 1980s, Egypt and the independent Sudan started to dig the canal. It was also here in this almost unbearably humid marshland that my lifelong interest in the Nile really took hold of me. When I came here, this old colonial plan had been turned into one of Africa's biggest development projects. Then this monster stood digging at the edge of the swamp. In a dramatic way, it pointed towards a new era more water was to be brought to the north and the traditional societies in the swamp area were to be modernized. The leader of the project proudly told me that they were creating a new river the size of the Seine in the heart of Africa. A project of 200,000 acres to produce food and to produce 
fiber for our people who are hungry now. Those who lived here, however, were not as enthusiastic. Shortly after the civil war in Sudan again broke out, one of the first moves of the rebels was to kidnap and kill several canal workers. The development project I had come here to study had become a weapon of war. The guerrillas wanted to stop their enemy in the north getting extra water. Today, a rusty bucket wheel is a reminder of an exciting dream that collapsed. And the guerrillas that stopped the canal project are now in charge of South Sudan. We struggled and fought for a very long time to have a country of our own. We will not make careless decisions. The Jongole Canal and any other canal, we will suspend it until we build the nation. But the desert countries in the north, Sudan and Egypt, are impatient. They want the water in South Sudan immediately. There is a lot of water wasted every year uh, in the south. I come up to 42 billion cubic meters of water lost. The uh, construction of these canals will uh, reclaim some of this water. The Zongri Canal is a must for the future of Egypt and a must also for the other countries of the Nile Basin to share in the, of the Nile water. The battle over the future of the swamp will be of crucial importance for Egypt, Sudan, and South Sudan. Yes, in future we'll consider the rehabilitation of the Jongole Canal, but it will be after we have done very serious studies. Many people fear that the canal will have negative consequences for the people who live here. In the swamp area, the pulse of societies has, since time immemorial, followed the water's natural and rhythmic movement in the landscape. Millions of people live in symbiosis with the river's water. When the flood comes every year, the semi-nomadic people must migrate with their herds to distant hills where the water will not reach them. And when the flood each year recedes, after watering vast areas, people and cattle have to follow. In the long, dry season, when it does not rain at all, these communities are forced to live on the banks of the Nile. The dictatorial whims of the Nile have here prevented development. If the swamp is drained and canals are dug out, the ancient way of life will come under pressure. Some politicians in South Sudan believe that the canal can at last modernize their country, while others fear for the future of traditional communities. The issue of the future of the swamps is splitting opinion in South Sudan, already a weak state. These swamps will, in the coming decades, play a key role in the country's relationship with Egypt and Sudan.
and the battle for water is, here as everywhere, entangled with religious and cultural differences. South Sudan is an African country where Christianity has a strong standing and where suspicion of the Muslim countries to the north is deep. It is this young and exceptionally thinly populated state that will now decide whether the old British dream of draining the swamp to provide more water for the desert countries of the north will be put into effect. For Egypt, the Nile is life. They will do everything possible to get a drop of water. South Sudan and travel further up the Nile. We will see what it involves when more upstream countries look to the White Nile as the powerhouse in their drive for modernization. From the air, it's clearly visible how Uganda is defined by the fact that the whole country lies within the Nile Basin. But what we're looking at here is also Egypt's lifeline. Uganda is therefore preparing for possible conflict over how the river should be utilized. In 2010, Uganda bought six new fighter aircraft. Ugandan newspapers wrote that they needed the planes in order to be prepared should there be war with Egypt over the Nile. We are therefore completing our capacity building so that there is durable security and there is all threats of a military nature. Although Uganda is located all of 3,000 kilometers south of Cairo, Egypt has had the power of veto over how Uganda exploits the river. To understand how the Nile affects relations between the two countries today, we must again go back in time. It was in this part of Central Africa that European explorers traveled in the 19th century, seeking the answer to the greatest geographical mystery of their time. Where was the source of the Nile? These explorers were the forerunners of a European race up the river and of the colonization of Africa. books about unknown people and exotic animals caused a sensation in the drawing rooms and salons of Europe. This stretch along the river is called Para in the local language, or Hippo Home. The White Nile's largest waterfall is called Wang Yok, or House of the Spirits. This waterfall has been an ancient center of occult rituals. And for Uganda's dictator, Idi Amin, it was a suitable place to throw his opponents to the crocodiles. It was also to this waterfall that the then colonial secretary and later British Prime Minister, Winston Churchill, came over 100 years ago. 
Here stood the young Winston Churchill in the early 1900s and predicted that hydropower would make Uganda the powerhouse of East Africa. He envisioned factories and warehouses along the many waterfalls in the country. Had Churchill's ideas been realized in the early 20th century, Africa's recent history would have been very different. It soon turned out, however, that the British government and the British who controlled Egypt had very different visions for the river. It all starts when the British explorer John Hanning Speak, around 1860, finally concludes that the Nile, the cradle of Christian civilization, as he called it, flows out of this inland sea. This new knowledge about the geography of the Nile seals the fate of those who live here. So important is this giant lake that the locals call it Nalubale, or the God Mother. British explorers baptize the Nile Lake after their godmother in London and call it Lake Victoria. Only 20 years later, the British occupy Egypt, making it only a matter of time before they also establish control over this Nile source. The British in Cairo write that the water here is as important as gold for Egypt. I'm heading for one of the most important sites in the history of colonialism, where the White Nile flows out of Lake Victoria. Here, the British thought they could dam the lake to provide all the water for all future for all the cotton fields in Egypt. Local people who here sing songs eulogizing the Nile became pawns in this imperial river strategy. But the British soon learned that it was much harder than they first thought to send more water from here and thousands of miles down to the Mediterranean. They were forced to realize that the extra water would just disappear in the large swamps of southern Sudan. Another example of how Nile geography binds together countries' development in ways that politics cannot overcome. In the 1950s, the young British monarch, Queen Elizabeth II, comes to the shores of the lake. It came a breathtaking moment in African history when Her Majesty temporarily stopped the flow of the River Nile. The Queen opens Uganda's first power plant on the Nile, called the country's beginning. Relations with Egypt were now so bad, and the international demand that colonial powers had to do much more to develop their colonies so strong, that London, for the first time, set out to exploit the Nile in Uganda for the good of Uganda. Egypt condemns the dam because it's located in enemy territory, but accepts it eventually, provided that four of its engineers be placed there to ensure that Uganda did not take more water than agreed. They are still there. It's not widely known, but one of the most important events during the Cold War was closely related to the Nile question. After Nasser nationalized the Suez Canal in Egypt 
and expelled tens of thousands of Europeans, the British decided, in deep secrecy, to study a drastic proposal. Was it possible to divert the Nile in Uganda in such a way that Egypt would be adversely affected? They had long had a plan B to exploit their control over the Nile, where it flows out of Lake Victoria, as a weapon against a potentially intractable Egypt. One of the explorers had written back in 1880, the Arabs have drunk at these waters for thousands of years. Erect a dam so as to command the waters, and the Arabs will obey you. However, when London found out that the Nile was not as effective a weapon as they had hoped, they instead resorted to a conventional war against Egypt. The British lost primarily because of opposition from the United States. The Suez Crisis, which started because of disagreements about a dam over the Nile, ended with the collapse of the British Nile Empire. Colonialism in the region ended, but the agreements about the Nile that London had signed with Egypt continued to determine the use of the river in the decades that followed. This is the 2011 election campaign, and President Museveni was, as the first leader of Uganda, very clear about the Nile. It was to be the engine driving his country's development. In the capital, a water conference is in progress. The president will make a speech. He ridicules the British argument that Uganda had no demand for Nile water. You people you have got rain, but these were the British. Say so you people in the tropics, you have got rain water, so you don't need the river water. Of course we have now rejected this. Although it rains a lot in Uganda, parts of the country experience recurrent droughts. The president has therefore proposed to canalize water from the Nile out to the dry areas in the northeast where the Karamojong people live. Egypt stopped this project, referring, as always, to the agreement they had signed with the British in 1929. In the capital, Kampala, business people are angry because they do not have electricity. Spent over two days without power, seriously affecting their business operations. The government's solution to this problem too is the Nile. Only 5% of the population of Uganda gets power. And even then, it is erratic. We hope that our industrialization process will be fast-tracked or accelerated by the availability of, availability of hydropower. The Nile is Uganda's white gold. Everywhere in the green, lush landscape, water is flowing full of energy. At last, after more than 100 years, Churchill's vision of turning the Nile into the country's workhorse is becoming a reality. But here too, it is easy to see that modernization always has its price. People used to come to the Bujugali Falls from the entire world for whitewater rafting. Now the falls are gone, and this man was one of the last to carry out extreme sports in the falls. 
In 2012, the Bujugali Dam is finished, the first in a long series of planned dams on the Nile in Uganda. The Nile plays an even larger part in the country's plans. The government of Uganda emphasizes that Uganda must also understand the Egyptian situation. So that was God is designed, the water flows from this end and ends up in the Mediterranean. So we have to change our mindset to realize that the people of Egypt need this water for their livelihood. For us, we need it because of this and this and that. For them, they need it for everything. Lake Victoria is known for its special mayflies. These black serpentine columns consist of billions of flies. They come up from the sea every night to mate and immediately afterwards to die. The brevity of their life can stand as a contrast to the Nile water's eternal strategic importance, which will forever bind Uganda and Egypt to a common destiny. One of the world's truly classical train journeys runs from the Indian Ocean over the Kenyan highlands and down to Lake Victoria. I'm taking a train that exists because of the Nile quest, and we shall see how it helped to create the country now called Kenya. When the British took power over Lake Victoria in 1894, they immediately decided to build this railway. They would show the world that they meant business when, in 1890, they declared that the Nile was in their sphere of interest. In order to build the railway, they brought tens of thousands of workers from India. When the railway was completed, the Indians stayed on. So the Asian minority in East Africa, which now plays such a central role in the area's economy, exists thanks to British interests in the Nile. It was also this railway that turned Kenya into the only British settler colony in Africa. London lured white settlers to this area in order to increase production and transportation of goods, which again should finance the operation of the railway they had built. But not even the white settlers in Kenya were allowed to use any of the waters of the Nile. Although most of the water in Lake Victoria comes from Kenya. The capital, Nairobi, originally founded as a construction centre for the railway, is currently East Africa's economic hub. Here I meet one of the country's most famous Nile experts. I'll ask him about Kenya's attitude to the Nile agreements. When you are refining, you are refining your irrigation before Jesus was born. We were not around. When you negotiated the 1929 agreement, we were not around. The colonialists were bent on appeasing you for whatever reason, so that you can give free access to the Suez Canal or whatever it is. 
1959, these guys came to an agreement between themselves, and they call it for total utilization of the waters of the Nile. <laughs> total utilization, and they're talking between themselves. I mean, what arrogance. In 2010, the Kenyan government formally rejected the old treaty. Nothing stops us now from using the waters as we wish. It's now up to Egypt to come on board and agree with us that we are going to share these waters. Kenya has now joined her East African neighbors of Uganda, Ethiopia, Rwanda and Tanzania in ratifying the revealed treaty, which seeks to give them authority to use more of Lake Victoria waters. Egypt has in the past warned that any action to divert Nile water resources will be treated as an act of war. Kenya, known abroad for its animals, will now use more Nile water for its people. I look out over Masai Mara, one of the world's most amazing wildlife sanctuaries. Animal life here is also part of the big story about the importance of the Nile. The Mara River is a tributary of the Nile. The water here flows into Lake Victoria and down to Egypt. Masai Mara is the scene of the planet's most famous animal migration. Twice every year, millions of wildebeest, zebras and other animals cross this Nile River. They must follow the rain over the plains, although many will die in pursuit of water and pasture. But this animal migration is now under threat, say many people, because the river is changing. So even the wildebeest, you know, they, you know, they, they recognize, you know, what the hell is happening, because you know the Mara is no longer the Mara. You know, the Mara forest is always, of course, you know, you have the, you know, the steam or the moisture from the forest, and then they attract the cloud. Climate change and local deforestation gets the blame. Kenya campaigns for tree planting. They argue it will cause more rain in the Maasai land and increase water flow in the Mara and thus also in the Nile. Fear of future climate change is an overriding uncertainty in the Nile Basin. It will encourage cooperation and more effective ways to use the water. But it will also accentuate the quest for enough water. The uncertainty about how much water the Nile will carry links, in new ways, these wide plains of East Africa to Egypt's future. In 1994, Uganda and Kenya declare parts of Lake Victoria as a disaster area. Thousands of corpses are floating in the water. Hutu extremists in Rwanda had murdered Tutsis, thrown them into the rivers that wind through the land, and declared that the river should send the enemies out of the country for good. When the carnage was stopped, it was a turning point in the history of Rwanda, and the country could now also seriously engage in the contest on the future use of the Nile. You 
come dear. Humid clouds always enshroud Rwanda's rainforest. I'm on my way to see some of the world's few surviving mountain gorillas. These gorillas, living on the fringes of the Nile Basin, are, in contrast to humans and other animals, dependent on neither rivers nor ponds. They get all the water they need by eating the plants around them. These rare and strong animals have now been declared to be the symbol of Rwanda's transformation. The country is aiming to become the African gorilla. Rwanda has, since the early 2000s, had an annual growth of well over 5%. The country has an upper speed limit of 60 kilometers per hour on all roads to reduce traffic injuries. No parliament has a higher percentage of women. The capital, Kigali, has been named as one of the world's cleanest cities. And overnight, they decided to replace French with English as the official language. The country's president, Paul Kagame is a controversial head of state, but with big plans and original ideas for development. We start with the things that we think are within our means to achieve, but that mean a lot to people's lives and the sustainability of the development. He emphasized that Rwanda would follow its own path. It comes with that commitment to say, what can we do? We do not have to wait for donors to pay for or to tell us to <laughs> ban plastic bags. Rwanda was the first country in the world to adopt such a ban, an illustration of its leaders' self-awareness and ability to build Rwanda as a brand. The city will focus on creating new jobs and businesses. Kigali, the capital, will be a business center, and this is the vision. But at the moment, most people still have to live off the land. In 2050, there will be 1,000 people per square kilometer here. The Nile rivers that run through the country down to Lake Victoria have historically been important cultural and religious metaphors and mythical boundaries. But now, they will also be used for irrigation and power. Some countries rely on this water more than others, or are thinking about it more than others. But that does not give them any more right on the use of this water than others. The colonial agreements cannot be ac accepted as, as valid anymore. On the way to the source of the Nile, deep in the Rwandan jungle, the soldiers' pride in the source being in their country convinces me that its new discovery has reinforced Rwanda's self-awareness as a Nile state. <laughs> the source is not particularly remarkable, but that is precisely what makes it so symbolic. It emphasizes how the Nile is created by thousands upon thousands of such small streams. This links Rwanda 
with what will soon be half a billion people in 10 countries, interlocked in a complex struggle over how the water in the river is to be exploited. So here are the humble beginnings of one of the many brooks and streams that create the river, which has lain behind the rise and fall of Egyptian dynasties, which has triggered wars of colonization and conquest, and which keeps millions upon millions of people alive every day, and which is now a part of Rwanda's plans for the future. Our journey up the White Nile through the river's history is nearing its end. I'm going to Burundi, the small southernmost country in the Nile Basin, which suddenly became a key player in the quest for the Nile. President M. Kurunziza brought stability to the country after he prevailed in a bloody civil war. The president is a practicing Christian and also has his own football team called Hallelujah Football Club. The president's team is today playing a team from Rwanda in a friendly. Rwandan President Kagame is happy just to watch, but the president of Burundi is an active football player. There are many political disagreements between the two countries, but they now stand together in their demand for a new Nile regime. The Burundi adhère à ce genre de nouveaux accords qui donnent donc du profit, mais aussi qui améliorent la situation présente. Burundi became independent in the 1960s and has never accepted the colonial Nile treaties. When the Mubarak regime in Egypt was toppled in 2011, Burundi joined the five other upstream countries' new agreement on the Nile and thus the agreement took effect. In the capital, I check into a hotel called Source du Nil. But how can this country too boast of having the source of the Nile? And what does that mean for the contemporary Nile quest? One of the many chapters in the Europeans' hunt for the sources of the Nile was played out here on Lake Tanganyika nearly 150 years ago. Above the sea, not far from the capital, stands a large solitary stone that testifies to Europe's Nile obsession. Two names are carved into it, Livingston and Stanley. The journalist Henry Morton Stanley crossed Africa on foot, found the missionary David Livingstone, who had been missing for years, stretched out his hand and greeted him with the world-famous words, Dr. Livingstone, I presume. After the meeting, the two traveled along the shores of this lake in search of the Nile and came here in 1871. But the Nile outlet was not here, though Livingstone believed so till his death. It would, in fact, turn out that Livingstone was closer than many of his contemporaries thought. At the university in Bujumbura, I give a lecture on Nile history, and here I meet the country's water minister. Le nous permet de communiquer avec le monde de le monde méditerranéen. Donc c'est comme un cordon ombilical qui relie le Burundi à la Méditerranée. We leave the capital and not many miles from where Livingstone and Stanley's names are carved in stone, 
we meet a man who can show us the southernmost source of the Nile. On the ridge above the spring and overlooking the Congo, a mini replica of the pyramids in Egypt was erected in the 1930s. It should tell the world that the very premise of Egyptian civilization originates here. Now it's a monument to a mindset of the past. The small Nile country Burundi helped to overturn the old Nile regime. And the pyramid is now primarily a reminder of the era lasting several thousands of years when the Nile was and was perceived as Egypt's river. In the next program, we will travel along the Blue Nile from Alexandria on the Mediterranean coast and through the world's most ancient granary. We shall cross the deserts of Sudan and travel by train in Eritrea. Finally, I fly up the Blue Nile, which is now at the center of unparalleled development on the Nile. This is the construction site of the Grand Ethiopian Renaissance Dam.